Hi, I'm Terry Wolf, and this is the second lecture in this series where I try to explain my take on the New Testament and Revelation especially. I wrote a book called Maybe Everyone is Wrong, Revelations, Conspiracy, and the Kingdom of Heaven. This lecture is titled The Nature of the Battle because it's about trying to really pinpoint how you can tell that you're in a fight in the kingdom. Just off the bat, I'll give you a quick introduction, the same as last time, uh, except faster. I am not an expert. I am not making factual claims about any group or people. I, this is all my personal speculation. I could be wrong. I have varying degrees of confidence. <clears throat> I'm not supremely confident in everything. Some things I don't understand that well. Other things I understand better. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees religious freedom which is the right to entertain such beliefs, such religious belief as a person chooses, the right to declare religious beliefs openly and without fear of hindrance or reprisal. Now, I'll start off talking about the nature of the battle by asking, are we far off from Christ's example today in our churches that we see? Did Jesus want the church systems that we have today? Is that what he was going for? Is that the ideal he was trying to create? Did he want institutional religion at all? Did he want his followers and believers to get along with the world and ignore the contradictions of false Christianity? When you see false Christianity, does he want you to accept it and turn a blind eye to it, or engage with it and fight it? Or did he want his followers and believers to challenge the world and become a light that would expose lies and darkness? And that can mean many things. There's many different ways that that takes shape. We know that Jesus preached the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God. To him, the good news was that the kingdom was going to be and it was imminently available and attainable for mankind, which it wasn't before. He warned that the kingdom had enemies who would rule the world. The kingdom, you know, is powerful and it can't be touched because it's in heaven. But on this earth, Satan rules. And it hates the kingdom. And it will do anything it can to drag the kingdom down into the gutter and make it worthless. He warned that the conspiracy would not only oppose, but imitate and counterfeit his holy kingdom. He actually talked about that. So the conspiracy is not just opposition. It is also competition the conspiracy is to compete with the true gospel of the kingdom. Anything that competes with Jesus' gospel of the kingdom is opposition in its own way. So anything that competes against the awareness of Christ's division of good and evil that we talked about in the last lecture is the enemy. That includes anything that blurs the line between good and evil, between the division that Christ made. Anything that merges good and evil and tries to combine them, to reconcile them. Anything that downplays the differences between good and evil. See, there's lots of ways that this division actually is something that we need to defend because there are lots of ways to weaken that division and make it seem like it's not really that much of a division after all. Anything that unifies opposites. Which brings us to one of the key words we need to learn, we need to be very aware of, is ecumenism. Or you'll hear of ecumenical missions or ecumenical movements. That is, people concerned with promoting unity among churches or religions. This is the main goal of the Catholic Church, is to unify their 
what they think of as the main global central Christianity, the legitimate church, in their argument, with all the other religions of the world, and find a way to integrate all of them together, to merge all of them. It's the very opposite of Christianity and Christ's message. Because light has no union with darkness. Good has no union with evil. They cannot get along. In John, we hear him describe, The light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The evil, the satanic, the conspiracy, they can't even comprehend the light. That's one of the reasons why they keep trying to partner up with it again and think they can get along with it, think they can counterfeit it. Jesus, on the other hand, taught us to identify, how to identify counterfeit Christianity in ourselves and around us. So it's an internal and an external problem. Anything that is not promoting the divisive kingdom is a different gospel than the one Jesus taught, because Jesus taught about division and how things should be divided and how to identify things correctly so you can divide them, you can separate them. Of course, Jesus is central to the kingdom and his life epitomizes the kingdom as it plays out on earth. He caused major divisions. Literally, B.C. and A.D., he, he split the whole timeline of the world history. He, he divided the world in pretty much every way a person can. And yet people say he's a unifier and he doesn't want division at all. No, I, I say the opposite. I say he wants there to be correct division of all things. And I think that is what the Gospels constantly are promoting, and the whole, un the whole New Testament does, actually. That's what the last lecture was about. And he shows you how it plays out. His teachings and example prepare his followers to decipher the real kingdom from the false one. He says, I am the good shepherd, and my sheep, and, or, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. Meaning, there will be sheep who do not belong to him, and he does not know them. And so it's a mutual relationship. doesn't matter how many people claim that they are the sheep of Christ. Those who are truly following him are known by him, and they know him. And that whole passage in, in John 10 is very important to be able to recognize how much emphasis Jesus really, truly put on it. If you, if you count up the number of times Jesus talks about fake Christians who are going to try to sneak into the kingdom and corrupt it, it's constant, it's constant. He always wants us to be mindful of the false religion that is going to try to imitate what he's setting up. And that brings us to what satanic thinking is, because I use this differently than most people do. And I think the way I use it is more effective, more useful. Satanic thinking is the type of opposition that Jesus actually had while he was preaching and teaching. It is not an open hostility to the truth. It's not that people heard Jesus and then said, I hate you because... You're saying nice things and you're telling the truth. No, no. They didn't want to do that. They didn't want to make it seem like they were even against Jesus necessarily. So it is not emotional savagery. Don't picture, when you think of satanic thinking, don't picture a crazy person who's trying to kill and do violence. That's not how Satan works. Satan is much more subtle than that. It says in Genesis that he's the most... You know, the reason, or at least the reason why they used the, the serpent in the story, and presumably Satan actually took the form of the serpent, is because he was the most subtle, not the most violent. It wasn't a bull or a, a lion. It was a snake. Generally, what you see with Jesus, which I think we should be going according to since he's our example, is confused rebuttals. 
And that's a strange thing to think about, but it's what we see. People who are trying to give a rebuttal against Jesus, but they themselves are confused and they don't know what to say. They don't know how to, how to come against him. They're just trying to oppose him somehow without really understanding what they're talking about. It's the darkening of wisdom. This is something the Bible, even in Proverbs and everywhere, talks about, is those who darken the counsel, those who take away what you do understand. You think you understand something and it's good. Someone comes by and they can plant ideas that end up weakening it, darkening it, and making it so you don't understand it anymore. It's the blinding of your eyes. Leading astray. That's, that's different yet. Even if you, they don't challenge your ideas, they don't make it so that you, you uh, lose sight of your ideas. They'll just start leading you into paths that go nowhere. It's the shrouding of truth. It's complication. Complicating things that are simple. Jesus had a lot of simple teachings that people should have just instantly understood. But instead... What did they do? They, they always tried to complicate it. They always raised some objection. The word I want you to learn is pedantry, or to be pedantic. This is really at the crux of what it means to be a satanic thinker. To be overly concerned with technical accuracy of minor details, or emphasizing the letter of the rules as opposed to the spirit of the rules. This is why the whole Old Testament legal system became so corrupt. It's, it's the main thing, in a sense, that Jesus fought against with the Pharisees. Is pedantic people, a pedantic system that took something simple and pure and good and forced God to create a whole establishment around it, an institution, which is what we were talking about, the institutional side of religion. Jesus doesn't want that. He wants there to be a direct relationship with God for every single person, not an institution. Another way of saying it is lawyering, because a lawyer is not concerned with doing what is right. A lawyer is concerned about advocating for a side and then digging into whatever kind of terminology or loopholes you can to justify it, to get away with it. So you convert the simple, powerful, and pure word of God into a complex maze of rules and expertise. Wherever there's this satanic thinking, before long you get experts coming out and the experts want to tell you how you have to believe everything, because you can't trust the spirit, you can't trust the word, and you have to go by to go through their maze that they want to lead you through. It's to not hear the principle behind the commandment first. Commandments almost always have a very simple principle behind them. God is angry at something, or he wants something done. He wants to correct something. But instead of just understanding why, understanding what he means, we, we ignore that. People ignore it, and then you get your complex maze of rules instead. Oh, God said this, I guess we have to make all of these other adjustments. No, just understand the principle behind it. That's why Jesus is always saying, let those who have ears to hear you see how that rules out everybody who wants to make it complicated? This is the beauty of Jesus and his wisdom. Those who have ears to hear. Do you have ears to hear? Can you just hear what he's trying to say? Or do you feel the need to constantly make a rebuttal or complicate it or spin it off to something else? Just listen. Have ears to hear. What is he trying to say? And when we re realize and when we keep in mind that Jesus is the word of God, then having ears to hear really takes on a new significance. Because to complicate Jesus into something that's hard to understand or follow is the same as attacking the word of God. So that's why a false religion, a false Christianity, 
that creates a bunch of dogma and rules and stipulations and burdens, because makes Jesus into a burden. That's how you know it's not true Christianity, because it's you don't have ears to hear if you're complicating the Word of God, and Jesus is the Word of God. How does Jesus fight this satanic thinking? He's bold. He's direct. He's flexible. He's balanced. He's spirit-guided, and he focuses on the heart of the matter, not technicalities. Over and over, the Pharisees and his opposition tried to pin him into a corner because they would ask him trick questions, and it even says they were just looking for a way to catch him so that they could accuse him. And Jesus replied with bold, direct, balanced, spirit-guided messages that went to the heart of the matter and ignored their technicalities. He did not answer foolish questions with indulging them, but he rebuked them for even asking a foolish question. He refused to let go of the principle at the heart of the matter. He engages opposition in order to win the audience not to empower the other side's validity. He's not trying to have a conversation because he really cares about what this satanic thinker wants to say to him. No. He, he only engages them because there's people listening, and for their sake, he wants to show them the difference between a true, not a true prophet, the actual king, the Messiah, and all these little quizlings who want to go around and, and pull away from his glory, pull away from his teaching, pull away from his wisdom, make it about something else, accuse him of something. And that's one of the reasons why his works were so important, his miracles. Good deeds speak louder than words. Even if you don't have an articulate mind and you haven't practiced and trained yourself to be able to make strong points when you're talking or writing, good deeds will just speak louder. And then if you oppose something because you know it's wrong, what can they say to you? If Jesus did miracles and he healed the sick, and then when they tried to accuse him of something, the opposition was right there. And it even says in the Bible that they said, he has the a devil in him. He's not making any sense. He's speaking in parables. And then the other said, how can he have a devil if he's doing good deeds and great miracles? That's a principle we need to understand. That's why Jesus did things the way he did, because he could have explained everything perfectly, but he specifically spoke in parables. He condemned lawyers and legal experts because they corrupted God's ways. This comes down to the same point. It's what I'm saying about satanic thinking. It's the nature of the battle. It's between those who are focused on God's word and what the principle and meaning is behind it, the spirit of it, and cut through everything. And those who want to complicate it and turn it into a legal maze, a nightmare that is burdensome. Jesus allowed himself to be misunderstood, not only as an example, but because it's actually effective. It's effective to tell the truth and then let people attack you. He let himself be accused of false teaching, heresy, and blasphemy. He barely even defended himself, except in this sort of minimal way to expose those who were lying against him, but and show their hypocrisy. But he didn't go on these giant arguments, debate stage, with ten Pharisees all arguing against him for five hours straight. We don't have any account like that, because he wanted to cut to the heart of the matter and preach that kingdom and give the good news of that kingdom that divides good and evil and say, it's here now, you can be a part of it, and this is what it looks like. He spoke in riddles to make sure that only those who truly wanted to hear his message would understand. And sometimes even those who did want to hear it couldn't understand it because 
it says that he was speaking in riddles so that they couldn't understand. We see in Matthew, all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Now, isn't that amazing? Because those same parables that they didn't understand, we might take them for granted as Christians today because we hear them a thousand times in a church and we think we understand them. But when he said them, and I think still today, they are very misunderstood and he's actually uttering things that were kept secret since the foundation of the world. That's how profound they were. See, Jesus was trying to be profound. He wasn't trying to be perfectly understood by all of his enemies. In order to understand this, you need to have discernment. And discernment is one of the fruits of the Spirit. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is crucial to serving in the kingdom of heaven. It directs, instructs, mediates, harmonizes, comforts, and warns us. That's a lot of things to do. It does the job of an entire priesthood and legal system, and it does it better than either of them could. So how do I know what the heart of the matter is in any given situation? I said you should, you should ignore the satanic thinking and just cut to the heart of the matter. How do you know what that is? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a radar for good and evil. A radar doesn't tell you everything about what's going on. It just signals you. It, it alerts you to something. It tells you this is good, this is evil. And then you have to start thinking, what does the Word of God say? Why is this not feel right? What was wrong with it? What just barely happened? How do I make it good? What, what good can I do in this situation? That's up to you to think about, discern it, think of the scriptures, but the Holy Spirit is more like a radar. It's going to alert you. That's how you can get to the heart of a matter. It detects subtle differences and points out what really matters in a given situation. If the Holy Spirit within you is bothering you, there's something you need to examine it. And sometimes it can be a very subtle difference. Somebody can say something that's almost correct, and maybe they even have good intentions. It's not that everybody who's wrong is satanic and evil. It can just be a simple misunderstanding, a simple problem that could happen to anyone, an accident. But you can notice that something just barely was wrong and find a way and an opportunity, a, a good time to bring it up. You know, there's a good way to bring up problems and there's a bad way to bring up problems. But the Holy Spirit can alert you to what really matters in a situation. It gives us help to express things that are difficult to explain. People have told me that I'm good at articulating complex things. It's because for the whole first half of my life, I was extremely misunderstood. I barely knew how to communicate. Uh, my brothers had to translate for me, basically, because I would talk in fragments of sentences, and I would be so in my own head that I didn't make sense to people around me. And as I got older, I got sick of that. And I made it a very clear mission to learn how to think the way other people need to hear in order for me to make sense to them. And it's not been an accident. It's not a natural gift. It's, a, it's because I try hard and I believe the Spirit helps me in things especially difficult to express. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. We all have plenty of infirmities, shortcomings. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself, the Spirit, this is one of the things I love. The Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Haven't you had that feeling? 
where something is just groaning in you to, you can't utter it, you can't articulate it. You want to be understood, you want to say it how it should be said, but you can't. The Spirit is actually there for you when that happens, because we have infirmities. And he that searcheth the hearts, Jesus, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Jesus is there in heaven as our spirit groans and tries to to speak to the Father. The Spirit communicates to Jesus and He can make intercession for us. So don't Fear misunderstanding because Jesus himself, who is the ultimate example, was misunderstood pretty much constantly. And furthermore, most misunderstandings are intentional, whether consciously or subconsciously. People misunderstand simple things because they don't want to hear the truth. They don't like what's being said, so they happen to misunderstand it. But if it was something they wanted to hear, you'd only have to say half a sentence with half the words, and they would get it right away because they want to understand it. Let satanic thinkers pick apart words and be pedantic because they will reject the truth no matter what you say. No matter how articulate you are, they will try to find a way to rip it apart because they don't want the truth. Focus on the greater truth when they do that and the heart of the matter and speak to those who may listen to the meaning of what you're saying. Towards Christians, be patient. Understand that they also have difficulty in explaining and expressing. It's so important. And you may ask, doesn't the Holy Spirit really... I thought the Holy Spirit was supposed to give us magic powers and let us do miracles. I've heard people say stuff like that. I don't have the Holy Spirit because I can't do X, Y, and Z. I can't do special things. They don't even realize that the Holy Spirit is doing so many... Well, maybe they don't have the Spirit, actually. And that could be it. Because I think the Holy Spirit does do a lot for us. And if you know what it does, you can see it in action, in yourself. But as for this, doing miracles and magic powers, to truly teach somebody the word of God is magic. What else is it? For somebody to hear, for the first time, the real message that God, <laughs> that God wanted mankind to hear, That's magic. <sighs> to renew the soul is a miracle. To penetrate the lies of Satan is power. To cut through lawyerism is holiness. These are things the Spirit does. You have to let Jesus be your example. What did he do? Did he go into extreme detail and argue the law? He brought up the law in some cases. In fact, he brought up some of the most controversial laws. He said to the Pharisees about how they don't stone and kill their own children when they are disobedient. You know, he reminded them of the law that They'd completely abandon because it was inconvenient for them. So he knew the law and he definitely studied it and he fulfilled it and he knew what he had to do to fulfill it. There's no way that he was ignorant, but he cut through the lawyerism. He penetrated Satan's lies. He renewed the soul. 
He taught the true word of God because he didn't care about the legal pedantic style of teaching. Let the epistles be your example. Those are full of examples of people and teachings and heresies and confusions that were creeping into the church even then. This is why in the last lecture I emphasized how the whole New Testament is one unified message of a division of good and evil, as they say, runs down the heart of every man, but it also is a collective conspiracy against the church and the kingdom, and the kingdom against the conspiracy. And the epistles are a great example of the first battles that were happening in that never-ending battlefield. They're not the only ones, they're just the first ones. Today we have many more heresies, and they come from things that call themselves Christian, but are truly evil at the heart. Don't just memorize the Bible and admire Jesus and the disciples. Live out their example in your own way as you can. That's what this is getting to. There's examples in the epistles. Jesus himself, what did he do? How did he fight? How did he act? What is the nature of this battle that we're in? Live out their example. Cut through the lawyerism, the lies, and you will be persecuted. But you saw what happened to them, and we, we hold them in the highest regard because of it to this day. So what did Jesus really want? He wanted an army of servants to do good, to expose false religion, to call out hypocrisy, and to break down institutional barriers to God the Father, because this is all about how we get to God the Father. Jesus himself is just the bridge, the mediator. I mean, I'm, I don't want to downplay it and say he's just that, but that's what he came to be. He came to be the mediator, the Messiah, the one who would build the bridge between us and God the Father. He wants us to know God the Father. And that's what the Word and the Spirit are intended to do. Jesus is the example, and the Holy Spirit is the secret weapon we have. So we can look at Jesus in his life. He died, he was persecuted, he was falsely accused. They misunderstood everything he said. Even when he said it clearly, they hated it. And the more they learned about the truth, the more they hated him. Now, if we want to be an example, if we want to follow Christ, why are we not following that example? Why are we shying away from that? We should be embracing it and running to it. Not being contrary just for the sake of it, but to find the key points to hit, to weaken Satan's conspiracy and the false religion that God hates and expose it. Like I said in the last lecture, all of us begin in deception. All of us begin imprisoned in a system of lies. And when you escape it, that's a perfect opportunity to use that experience you have, that insider knowledge you have, to fight against that evil. Not necessarily there even, but anywhere you can to expose what you were through, what you went through and the, the flaws that you saw, and the hypocrisy you saw. And the Holy Spirit is the secret weapon to doing that. The nature of Satan's opposition to us needs more discussion. Because as I said, it's not violence. It's not open opposition. It's not hateful evil either. It's a deliberate distraction from the truth. It's good enough to distract you. He doesn't have to... Satanic thinkers don't have to destroy you in order to make you ineffective. They will try to entangle you in meaningless things. They'll bring up something that doesn't matter and just hope you go along with it. They will slow you down. You want to talk about something that's powerful, that's meaningful. They will bog you down in something else. If that doesn't work, they'll start accusing you in public to, to ruin your reputation so that others won't listen to you. They don't accept simple principles. This is the whole thing Jesus dealt with. I mean, they accused him publicly too. They 
slowed to try to slow him down. They tried to entangle him in meaningless things. These are things that don't just apply to us. This is what Jesus himself. I want you to love the Gospels and look at them as an example of what you yourself are going to have to go through if you really want to fight for the kingdom, because this is all going to happen to you if you really get into it. And if you don't, if you if you manage to have a smooth ride, hey, that's awesome. But he kind of gave you the best slash worst example, the most powerful, the most effective, but also the most hated. And they won't accept the simple principles. They demand examples to nitpick. So you say something that's almost common sense. Nobody should disagree with it, but they want you to give an example so that they can just pick, 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 and then make it sound like your point was worthless because they nitpicked some example you gave. They'll spread rumors about you and whisper about you and ask questions that don't mean anything about you so that there's just doubt around your whole character. If that doesn't work, or maybe they'll go the other route first and they'll flatter you. They'll say, you're amazing. You're the perfect person. You you do so much. You should be so proud. You do this, this, and this. Puff up your ego. I, we shouldn't want to have flattery. And I will say that there's a big difference between a genuine compliment from a Christian who appreciates you and somebody who flatters. I have had people try to flatter me, and it's very different than someone saying thank you for your work. Thank you for, you know, this simple message of thanks they give you. A flatterer has a goal. They want you to go a certain direction now that you're a big shot, now that you have uh, something, you know, something to what you're saying is really catching on. Oh, you should, they want you to become egotistical. That's what Satan did in the wilderness with Jesus. He tried to, uh, you know, hey, I'll give you all the world if you just bow and kneel to me. And Satan rebuked him to his face. And even, actually, I should say, even uh, when they called him good master, remember that? He said, you know, nobody's good but God. I think he was guarding against any sort of ego because he knew he was doing good and God was happy with him. But he wanted to reject flattery so that they couldn't use they couldn't get a foothold in his mind and start to say, oh, uh, you know, I'm the source of your pride, so, you know, you better start listening to me because if I suddenly say you're not doing so well, well, now, you know, now you feel bad because you had this ego and you're being kicked down a notch if you don't do what they say. Satanic opposition will try to lead you into dead ends. They will demoralize you. They'll say, this is pointless. You know, well, whatever you're doing here, maybe you only have three followers on some social media account. Maybe you have only one point you want to make. Maybe you don't have a whole list of things you want to teach people about. Maybe you have one little story that you tell people about something amazing that happened in your life. And that's it. So somebody could say, oh, yeah, well, I've heard that story already. Or, you know, that's it. You know, you don't have that much more. They want you to give up. Jesus doesn't. If nothing else, they'll counterfeit you. They'll they'll take what you do, and they'll make a fake version. They'll find a way to copy it, and then man, they'll hope that people just start listening to this version. It's a very similar thing. They'll use the same tactics if they can. Satan is the master of imitation. He loves to imitate God. That's why we have the Catholic Church. We have the fake churches. Many fake churches created by Satan because he has to counterfeit the real thing. The real thing, as I exposed, explained in the last lecture, is this decentralized network of basically special agents who don't even communicate half the time, but they're helping each other across the globe in ways that can't be predicted because the Holy Spirit is not predictable. And... The counterfeit version with Satan is this rigid, huge system that traps people. How do we serve the kingdom? Like I said, we do good 
because they can't argue with that. We speak God's truth because we need to in order to establish something. It's if you just destroy a lie, but you don't replace it with anything, it's not nearly as good as if you tell the truth. And also, if you tell the truth, you'll find out pretty quickly who's on the right side or not, because uh, it's a divisive thing. The kingdom is divisive. And you expose Satan's lies in the process. Of course, you avoid vain babblings, as the Bible warns about. You edify. This is another key word to understand. The Bible, at least a couple times, tells us to be edifying. And to edify essentially means to make understand. But it also has a deeper implication of to raise somebody up from a position of ignorance or doubt or fear. It's kind of this encouragement that also clarifies things. To edify is the big goal that we should have. And, you know, we serve the kingdom by having faith. <clears throat> but what do we really have faith in? We have faith... Well, I should say, many people believe that having faith just means that you believe God exists, or that, you know, that Jesus is the real, a real historical character. That's not even, that's not even the beginning of the conversation about faith. That is so obvious. I mean, I have no problem with people reinforcing it to, to you know, find the logic and make the arguments in favor of God existing and, and, this, and the Bible being true. But I think faith is a lot more than that because once you get into this kingdom and you're fighting, the na we're talking about the nature of the battle, you need faith because you need faith that the Holy Spirit will give you what you need when you're in the situation that counts. And a lot of situations don't count for much, you know. Uh, maybe you're talking with somebody who you don't really know. You have kind of a conversation that doesn't really go anywhere. Neither of you is really making a big challenging point and whatever. You could have done better maybe. But, you know, there can be situations that really count where something matters and you need to have faith that you can go into situations that you're not certain of and walk out of there having done good. That's scary. You need to have faith in order to go into those situations. You want to know how people end up leading. It's because they do what they can to prepare, but when it really comes down to it, they let the Holy Spirit lead. And I talk about being prepared for tribulation and to die for Christ. Nobody is prepared to go through full martyrdom before the Holy Spirit. Peter denied Jesus three times, or was it four? You know, in order to, after he said that he would never deny Jesus, but that was before he had the Holy Spirit. After he had the Holy Spirit, then he died for Jesus, didn't he? And he became a martyr. So you see the difference that the Holy Spirit makes. You can say anything you want, but when the situation comes, you need to have faith. The Holy Spirit will be there. And if you read the book that I suggest you read, which is The Martyr's Mirror, centuries of Christian martyrs and the example they set, especially in the face of the Catholic Inquisition to destroy true Christianity, which was its primary mission, those martyrs are unbelievably strong. And it's not because those farmers and average people were secretly ultimate trained, you know, special forces warriors. It's because the Holy Spirit was in them. And when the situation counted, the Holy Spirit took over. We need to have faith that Jesus has given us enough grace to take risks and fail. The term grace is often complicated through the satanic thinking into being some sort of magical thing again. It's not supposed to be magical. It's about permission. If I say, think about, this is one of the things that, that people lose sight of. Kingdoms used to be real things. And a king would give people grace, which was his way of saying, permission. I give you grace to go try something, to go do 
a mission to, to leave the castle and do something for the kingdom. You didn't, need to be, you didn't need to be monitored and controlled. If you had grace, the grace of the king, nobody could mess with you because you essentially had special permission. So if you have grace from Jesus, you don't need anything else. That's why the Bible and the epistles, they're constantly trying to tell people to go with grace and to trust in grace and to grow in grace. It's because they need to make bold moves. They were in a situation where people were being murdered. Very real conflicts, life and death situations. But they still went and did it. And they fought evil and lies. And they had the grace to do it and to take risks. And I believe, you know, they must have made mistakes but they had the grace to make up for it, to fix what they, what they broke, if they broke something. You know, we know that by the time Jesus is talking to the seven churches, he's got big warnings for them. So obviously the disciples didn't set up perfect churches that ran uh, 100%, right? So something went wrong and the church needed a lot of grace, but he still gave them warnings. So we need faith that he's going to give us grace. We need faith that everything will turn out for the best. The Bible says all things work towards the good of those who, who believe in God. And that takes faith because things don't seem like they're going to work out well. Especially when you realize <laughs> that dying is one of the things that can happen. God doesn't promise he's going to save your life once you follow him, and in fact, he says, take up your cross, be prepared to die. He who loses his life for my sake will gain it to life ever everlasting. You know, you're not supposed to be afraid to die. So to have faith that it's going to turn out for the best, even while you're about to die, that's real faith. Of course, we need faith, not only that Jesus was real, and that his story was real, but that his example that he set is a true example that if we follow it, we will be glorified like he is and we will find the resurrection like he did. And we will be counted worthy like he was. That takes faith because that is a hard example to follow. We need faith that the kingdom watches us and is on our side every step of the way as we serve. Isn't that an incredibly hard thing to even comprehend? That right now, above us, in heaven, where God's throne is, it says that there's a giant crystal floor. Why? Why is the, why is the floor crystal? Because you can see through it to everything that is happening on the ground, and he can see every single Christian that is in his kingdom and is serving him. And they celebrate every time someone is saved. They know what is happening here and they are on our side and they are rooting for us. That takes faith. Now, with all of that said, I've said a lot about divisions, attacking false religion, attacking those who are hypocrites. But if you hear this message and twist it to mean that you should attack Christians and accuse them easily, you are guilty of satanic thinking, because that's not what I was saying. You're taking something simple, you're misunderstanding the principle, and now you think it's about attacking Christians and just finding faults. No. This is an instinct we have to fight in ourselves first. Remove it from yourself first. Jesus said, remove the log that is in your eye so you can take out the speck that is in your in your neighbor's eye, in your brother's eye. We have to get rid of that satanic thinking in ourselves, the pedantic, small-minded, contrary, accusatory mindset. Because think about, this is, this is an example that blows my mind. Jesus did not go to Herod and say, hey, you killed, or, you know, talk about the, the, the rulers. I know that there was multiple Herods, but, you know, 
you could have talked about the rulers and the faults that they had killing an entire generation of infants when Jesus was born. The, the persons, the individuals, he wasn't so concerned with exposing their particular faults, was he? I don't recall many examples of him saying, hey, Pilate, you know, you did this, this, and this. I know your heart. I know your whole history. We know that he could do that. He didn't go and go through their whole laundry list of skeletons in their closet. He talked about the principle. He talked about the kingdom. He talked about the heart of the matter, not just the people in attacking the people. And when it came to Peter who tried to rebuke him and prevent him from uh, accepting his death, even Peter, who was on his side, was a devoted follower to him and was specifically trying to say, I love you so much that I don't want you to go through tribulation and die. Jesus himself says, get behind me, Satan. Do you see how crazy that is? People think that this is just Jesus being emotional and exaggerating. He's trying to, you know, make a big point out of something that, you know, maybe he's really emotional because he doesn't want to die, but he knows he has to. So when somebody says, you don't have to die, he says, get behind me, Satan, because he's rushing his thoughts or something. No, this is a clear-minded rebuke. And it's a way of saying, even a Christian who follows Jesus if you are setting your mind not on God's interests, but on man's interests, you are being like Satan. If you have no appetite for tribulation, if you fall away as soon as there's tribulation, if you shy away from controversy, even when something important is on the line, and you just let it go and let something terrible be said or happen, or some false practice or tradition getting in the way of understanding of God's real word. These, are, these can be Christians. You can have satanic Christianity. And Peter is the example. Jesus himself says, get behind me, Satan, not Peter, because Jesus himself recognized this very argument from Peter when he was taken to the wilderness where Satan was tempting him and said, an angel will not let you be hurt, so jump off this building, and they'll catch you. You know, he tried to flatter him. He tried to prevent him from following through this mission. And that's what Satan is still trying to do today, to get us to be soft and weak and terrified of the any pain, any trouble. Christians will say this to other Christians, you know, no, no, the rapture is going to save us all. We don't want to go through any... If God loves us, he'll never let us be hurt. Get behind me, Satan, if that's what you believe and that's what you're teaching. Satan wants the interests of men first, not God's first. The kingdom is about division. It's about fighting against our own instincts. It's not about accusing each other, ripping each other down. It's about all of us lifting each other up to be able to face this battle that we're all in and win, not just fight, but win. Successfully expose the evil and overcome it. So be patient to ignorant brothers and sisters because there is a lot of it. Be ready to rebuke them when they're erring and doing harm. That's an important principle but if they're simply struggling and they don't understand, help them. Harm is an important principle. Where is their harm being done? You know, there's a lot of little things that we can mention, we can bring up, we can try to improve. But where harm is being done to somebody's soul or somebody's understanding of God's word, and it may, it's going to make a real difference. We have to have the Spirit guide us to be able to rebuke people without punishing them just for being ignorant. There are situations where I've seen people, you know, somebody says, and often it goes like this, somebody just says something because they, they think it's the right way to, the right point to make, 
and they either said it wrong or it didn't come out the right way or, you know, maybe they were even incorrect about something, but someone will immediately come in and say, you're a false teacher. People have said that to me. You're a false teacher. I was teaching about trying to teach my beliefs about the millennial kingdom. Somebody says I'm a false teacher immediately. Why? Was I doing harm? No. And I wasn't pretending that I knew everything. But calling somebody a false teacher is an example of a damaging accusatory remark. Jesus and the disciples had the same struggles we do to balance discipline and generosity. It's a hard thing to get right. You want to be generous to people. You want to be kind to people. You want to be humble and serve people. It's all about serving the kingdom, especially the lowest. Not going to the highest and most famous and getting the prestige. It's about going to the ordinary person and trying to help them. And then you have all these divisions and complications and lies circulating and people don't know which way to turn and you have to have discipline. You have to be able to warn people and rebuke them while still being generous and charitable. That's what the meaning of charity is, is generosity, not of gifts, not of giving cash to people. When it says that you're nothing if you don't have charity, it's the charity of your personality to be able to put up with somebody because they're misguided. It's a charitable spirit. We have to all guard ourselves against hastiness to speak too fast, but we also have to be quick to evaluate situations. This is where the Holy Spirit becomes our radar again. And Jesus is in our example. To mature in the kingdom is to listen more readily and closely to the Spirit as it grows within us. When you're really maturing in Christ and in the kingdom, you start to be able to pick up on what matters and what doesn't better. You can, you can start to see which fights are worth having and which ones to let go. How to just extract yourself from a situation where nothing good is going to come out of it and focus on doing something better and teaching more. And that's lecture two, the nature of the battle.